to 1 uh, Kings chapter 15. I'm just going to read something I read this morning just to remind you that you can't look for perfect leaders. And a lot of people uh, don't like this about a leader, don't like that, and that's really not the concern. The concern is where do they stand on major issues? So 1 Kings 15, looking at verses 1 through 5, now in the 18th year of King Jer Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all of the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp, that is a presentation in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now, if you were here this morning, message number one, we examined the respect for human life. We talked about abortion, proved from God's word that abortion is an attack on the image of God and that abortion, the taking of the most innocent of lives, disobeys God's word and gets a special curse from God. Talked about that this morning. Also in this message this morning, we examine God's institution of law, his requiring respect for those charged with rightly enforcing the law. And those who enforce laws are ministers of God and should be respected as they protect those who do good from those who do evil. And we said that in voting, we wanted to uh, find the candidate who supports life and who supports law enforcement officials who protect us. So now in message number two, we're going to examine what God says about self-defense and border control. Both of those are on the uh, um, websites, or if you go to Google, you'll find them. They're, sometimes they're presented different ways. Just want you to know that people that want to deceive you are not going to always present their stand in words that reveal the truth. And uh, if you haven't done this, when I was teaching at College of St. Joseph, they asked me to teach uh, George Orwell's 1984 and to teach on socialism. And um, in 1984, George Orwell has warned about what would happen if socialism came in and took over a country. A uh, more interesting reading would be Animal Farm, if you haven't read that, in which he talks about the same thing, but presents it as pigs taking over the farm and running the farm. And uh, so that was interesting. So the question is, the series is How Should We Vote? And it will run for three Sundays, and we'll cover as many of the issues that appear either on the websites or on the, uh, the Google platforms that, that you can go to. First of all, I want to mention some things about guns that uh, is not really normally told to you. Guns are tools, you know, and their main concern for many years back in the founding of the country was to get food. And then whenever it became necessary to defend ourselves against the British, we have what we call Minutemen. Guns are historically recent, as a matter of fact. Prior to the creation of firearms, men defended themselves with clubs, spears, swords, bows and arrows, uh, or anything else that was available <laughs> to defend themselves. So the issue is not simply gun ownership. That's what we're being told is the issue. The actual issue is your right to protect life, family, and property. I don't know if you're following the McCloskey incident where the two attorneys, uh, the husband and wife, had a beautiful home inside a gated community and Black Lives Matter and Antifa came in. The attorneys came out with high powered, he had a high powered rifle, she had a pistol. And uh, the, uh, the uh, local um, judge there who supported Black Lives Matter and Antifa filed charges against them for defending their own property, okay? Uh, they were interviewed the other night on uh, <clears throat> Laura Ingram's, the Ingram Angle and uh, they were talking about some of the things that the Antifa and Black Lives Matter had said to them, threatened to rape his wife, threatened to uh, kill them and take over their home, that sort of thing. So the uh, government is in St. Louis is supporting the criminal. 
which is the opposite of what we said this morning the government's supposed to do, Romans chapter 13. So, uh, but departing, depending upon whose book that you read, firearms really are relatively hit, uh, recent. Um, PBS ran a history documentation some time ago and they placed it, the first recorded use of a firearm at 1364. By 1380, firearms had spread across uh, the uh, nation of nations in Europe, mostly handguns. By the early 1400s, the matchlock was actually on the scene. So it's very recent, as you can see. Uh, the principle that we're operating on here, uh, when you go to the polls to vote, let me repeat it. Look for the candidate who approves what God approves and disapproves what God disapproves. That's the principle we're operating on. So now you and I know what our founding fathers approved. They made it clear in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, in our Declaration and in our Constitution, they traced rights to the sovereign God and not to the government. Secondly, they put a self-defense principle actually in writing called the Second Amendment. Here's what it said. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, end of quote. When running for president against Donald Trump in 2016, Hillary Clinton defined a militia as the government. But obviously she doesn't know American history, or she knows American history and is hoping we don't. Possibly. What is the militia? The militia was always made up of private citizens. Matter of fact, most of the militia that responded quickly in the Lexington uh, encounter with the British um, were led by pastors. So what does true American history say? Quoting from the actual document of William Lincoln for 1774-1775, uh, here's what William Lincoln says. Quoting now, the Massachusetts legislature was concerned that the British use of force might spread beyond the Boston area. It therefore urged its inhabitants to band together as minute men into a local militia so that they might protect themselves from the British who were so thirsty for the blood of this innocent people. End of quotation. That comes from uh, original intent, page 100. So it was understood that citizens, not government, formed the militia. Minutemen and their militia were the patriots. If you ever have an opportunity to go to the Old North Bridge, there's a statue there commemorating the uh, Minutemen. So the question that I think we need to answer is this. Does God approve or disapprove of human self-defense? The concept of self-defense is in most cases also linked to war. One cannot believe the Bible and claim to be a pacifist, although I have over the years worked at the university level with pacifists, people who claim to be pacifists. So under the heading of a time for everything in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, you're familiar with that, right? Verses 1 through 8. One of the things that is stated in there in verse 3 is a time to kill and a time to heal. Verse 8, a time of war and a time of peace. Now, the common sense approach, I think, takes into account that we live in a sin-cursed world where some people are just going to destroy both property and the lives of other people. So let's look at this um, concept of self-defense under two categories. First of all, let's talk about national protection. There are literally, if you go through the Old Testament, there are literally hundreds of references to battles for national security. And I can't review them all, but you can study them for yourself. Listen to a few of them. Exodus 17, 9, Moses sent Joshua out to battle. Go out and fight with Amalek. In Judges 1, 9, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites. So when it came time to drive enemies from the promised land, God told the people, when you get to the land, it will be occupied by your enemies and you will be responsible for driving them out. Numbers 32, 6, Moses rebuked those who would not fight. Listen to this. And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, 
Shall your brethren go to war and shall ye sit here? I remember when we filed suit against the state of Kentucky over the right to educate our children in a church-run Christian school. Um, didn't have any Baptists right away that stood with us. The Catholics stood with us. The Lutherans stood with us. The uh, Churches of God stood with us. The Assemblies of God. The Churches of Christ. I think we had at the very outset one other Baptist church and then two or three came in later. But most of the Baptists ran and hid until we won and then they said, we were behind you all the way. And I said, yeah, uh, way back there. <laughs> so there is national protection. What about personal protection? Can a person actually take somebody else's life defending his person and property and family? Well, a man named Benaiah was threatened by two men in 2 Samuel 23, 20, if you want to read that. He defended himself with a spear. He was later threatened by an Egyptian, but then he had only a staff, kind of like a, a, a tall stick, maybe even the staff like a shepherd carried. So what he did is he defended himself against the Egyptian with his staff, took the Egyptian spear, and slew him with his own spear. There's no condemnation of him in the passage for doing that. So if our politicians today had been living then, they probably would have wanted to pass laws against spears. In Genesis 34, 26, Dinah's brothers defended their sister with swords. In Genesis 48, 22, Jacob on his deathbed rehearses to his son Joseph down there in Egypt how he used both sword and bow to protect his family against the Amorites. So if today's politicians had lived then, they would have sought to pass laws against the use of bows and arrows and swords, right? You see, the real issue is not the weapon. The real issue is the constitutionally declared right to defend yourself. So the issue today is not really guns. Politicians who say they're opposed to guns are usually protected by a crew of people following them who are armed. They had armed to the hilt. <laughs> Politics. The real issue is that politicians want to control who has guns despite what the Second Amendment says. One of the men who was a, a chancellor in uh, Japan was asked, why don't we invade the United States? And this man had attended the universities in the United States and graduated and he said, we better not try to invade the United States, the border of the United States, because there's a gun in the hand of every citizen. And the entire population becomes an army. So Saul's son, Jonathan, remember him, gave David a sword for self-defense when David fled from King Saul, 1 Samuel 22, 13. And then David, because he didn't want to kill King Saul because he believed Saul was God's anointed. And even though David had been anointed also by Samuel, it was 15 years before he came to power because he refused to do what his men wanted to do and kill King Saul when he had the opportunity to do so. So David's 400 men accompanied him and lived in the wilderness. And he told them in 1 Samuel 25, 13, Gird ye on every man his sword, and David also girded his own sword. Elisha the prophet advised Joash, 2 Kings 13, 15. He said, take up bows and arrows. This was in likelihood of the Syrian invasion. Remember when wicked kings captured Lot, Abraham's nephew? Remember that one? Genesis 14, 12. Abraham didn't say, let's negotiate. He didn't say, uh, I'm going to lay down my arms if you'll lay down your arms. Listen to what actually happened. Genesis 14, 14. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan and actually destroyed them and, and rescued Lot. 
Self-defense, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, it's natural. <laughs> it's also normal. Founding fathers knew the concept of common law. My attorney and I are studying, like I said, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, and uh, we have studied over the years the development of common law. Common law actually comes out of the Bible. And um, as you saw in the DVD in Sunday school this morning, the main reason young people coming out of state schools today have no concept of what's going on is they've been robbed of the opportunity to understand the biblical principles, which are the foundation of common law. So the founding fathers knew that common law was based upon the foundations of Christianity. And if you get a chance, if you're into studying on your own, um, purchase Dave Barton's book, Original Intent. You can get it from Amazon. You can get it also from his website, wallbuilders.com. And in there, he traces all of the development of these issues from basic Christianity. So pretty soon you're going to be voting. You want to vote for the candidate which approves what God approves and for the candidate who disapproves what God disapproves. Remember, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I took a lot of hits on this one on the Facebook, but I said every time a county or a state or the federal government makes a regulation that you must comply with in order to get a firearm, you have been infringed. The Constitution has been violated, you know. Every local, state, and federal regulation, ordinance, rule, is uh, stated against gun ownership is infringement. <clears throat> so that is gun control. So the Bible's pretty clear about self-defense. There's never any condemnation at all about a person who has had to defend himself against enemies. What about border control? Is there any such thing as border control in the Bible? When God made a covenant with Abram, God promised him the land, the promised land, and he gave the boundaries of it. Genesis 15, 18. Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And in another passage, he says over to the great sea, which would be the Mediterranean Sea. So if you take the boundaries that are specified there, everybody around Israel is a squatter. The only one that owns all the land that the Arabs own is really Israel. That's the one that's been promised to them. When the millennial kingdom is established, they will have it. Borders were important to them, and borders are important now. If you go back and read through the Bible, I'll just give you a few places, but just go and study it on your own. Egypt had borders, Genesis 47, 21, Exodus 8, verse 2. Canaan had borders, Exodus 16, 35. I just read part of them to you. The nation of Edom had borders, Numbers 20, verses 14 and 15. Interestingly, Moses was leading the people of Israel, and in order for him to get to the land of Canaan, he, without having to go all the way around a distant he had to go through the borders of Edom. Now think about this. In Numbers 20, verse 17, Moses had respect for the borders. He sent word to the king, we would like to cross through your borders. We promise not to damage anything, not to destroy any property. We promise not to take any of the crops that you have. We promise not to do anything to the animals that are owned by your people. All we want is permission to cross your borders. The king refused. Wouldn't let him do it. Why? Border control. <laughs> Moses took a different route in chapter 20, verse 21. It took him way out of his way. So border control has always been important. That is, except to self-seeking politicians. So with a hidden agenda, they want to tell us that it's not important. The cities of refuge, you familiar with those? Numbers 35, 27. People who were seeking revenge for something done against a family member, and they wanted to take it out on somebody who committed the act without hearing all the evidence. Those people who had committed the act could flee to the city of refuge, and nobody could cross those borders and take any action. As long as they were on the right side of the border, they were fully protected. Border control. The Philistines had borders, 
And when David got ready to align himself with the Philistines when he was trying to escape King Saul, in Joshua chapter 13, verse 2, we're told about their borders. He actually asked permission to cross the border and come to uh, see the Philistine king. The Amorites had borders, Joshua 13, 4. Moab had borders, Isaiah 15, 8. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel the prophet refers to Israel's inheriting their promised lands, and he called the borders, which we mentioned earlier in Ezekiel 45, 1, holy, holy borders. Jesus ministered in the borders of Tyre and Sidon, according to Mark 7, 24. Exodus 12, 48 uses the term stranger to refer to a person who has not been born within the borders of Israel. Leviticus 16, 29 clearly establishes a distinction when it refers to one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. The stranger did not have the rights and privileges that the citizen had. Legal immigration. <clears throat> the Bible promotes one set of laws for all people, both citizens and immigrants. So if you had somebody come into your land who was not a citizen, he had to obey the same laws that you did. You couldn't let him get by with violating the law and then hold a citizen accountable for violating that law. And Leviticus 24, 22 is that you shall have one manner of law as well for the stranger as for one of your own country, for I am the Lord your God. So the border is to be recognized based on the character of God. The preceding verses in context prevent the types of laws that are applicable to citizens and immigrants. Remember the story of Ruth, the Moabitess? She came from Moab. Um, <clears throat> Naomi and her husband and family had violated God's word by going down to Moab. And uh, so the, some things happened. The boys got married. They married Moabitesses. And when it came to time, she heard that there was now bread in Jerusalem, so Naomi said, I want to go back. And uh, so uh, Orpah didn't go with her, but Ruth said this. She said, uh, she said she was going to go back with her, and Naomi tried to get her to stay because she said, I can't have any more children. And here's what Ruth said. She's actually, what she says here is, I want to become a citizen. Ruth 1.16. Whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. She would later marry Boaz, and in order for her to do that, she would have to submit to the kinsman redeemer law, which was established as a national law. <clears throat> Then she would be, interestingly, she is included in the lineage of Christ. When Ruth crossed the border into Jerusalem, she became subject to Jewish law, to Jewish customs, and to Jewish religion. And her statement indicates that she knew that she was accountable in all three of those areas. So unless properly assimilated, an outsider would always be considered a stranger. And he would, he would have to obey the same laws, but he would not have the same privileges. I don't have time to go into the restrictions, but there were certain sacrifices he couldn't participate in, certain worship activities he could not go to because he was not a citizen. I remember years ago uh, having friends that were Italians, friends that were Mexicans, friends that were Germans, friends from other countries, and they did not refer to themselves as Italian-Americans. They referred to themselves as Americans. They had assimilated, okay? The other day I listened to Ilhan Omar and she said, we're not here to assimilate, we are here to dominate. And the Iman from Britain on Sean Hannity's show one night, he said, Sean, he said, we're not hiding anything from you. We're using religious liberty in your own constitution to take over your country. And Sean, you better start warning your wife and your children Sharia law is coming to your neighborhood. 
What really gets me is the number of American women out demonstrating for Sharia law. They obviously don't know what happens if Sharia law is imposed. It's pretty severe. So unless properly assimilated, an outsider would always be considered a stranger in Israel. So when you go to the polls to vote, remember this principle. Vote for the candidate who approves what God approves and who disapproves what God disapproves. It should not be hard. If you want to, go to Google and Google, put, type in Democratic Party. Type in Republican Party and all this stuff will come up to you. So we know that when we look at the Bible, and we've only covered just a small portion, God approves self-defense, God approves protecting our borders, and God approves legal immigration. The Democratic platform calls for removing our guns. The Democratic platform calls for unprotected open borders. The Democratic platform approves illegal immigration. The Republican platform supports guns. The Republican platform uh, wants to close the borders to illegals and let them come in the legal way. And the Republican platform will only approve legal immigration and support it. So when you go to the polls to vote, it's coming up. Vote for the candidate who approves what God approves and the candidate who disapproves what God disapproves. Amen? Let's we'll stand together for prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we love you. We live in a great country, and it's under threat right now, and it's up to us to stand up and be counted. It's up to us to fight, if necessary, to defend the liberties that our Constitution guarantees to us. And Lord, we have the Bible on our side. We absolutely know exactly what God's Word tells us for all these issues that we've talked about. So we ask you now as we open the altar to speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to do what you would have us to do in the coming election, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.